Well, welcome to This Week in Gallup. And uh, what's this, our annual show, Patty? I don't remember how many years we've been doing it, but... 21. Uh, how many? <laughs> 21 years. 21 years. All right. And you are the chairman of Tax and Rev in the House of Representatives, right? No, I'm the chairman of the House Appropriations and Finance Committee. Oh, okay. They've changed the name of it. All right. I'm sorry. Um, that's the the people that you guys have to make the budget up. That's right. We work on all the budget, all the expenditures for the state of New Mexico. How uh, how bad has Corona hit us? Are you going to be in really tough shape with Corona the coronavirus? You know, I think uh, there's still a, a lot to be uh, desired, and uh, what has kept us above water are the federal stimulus dollars that have come into the state of New Mexico. We got one big uh, chunk that came in last summer when we had to go into special session. And uh, we're anticipating another uh, CARES package from Congress after all the election stuff is behind us. We anticipate another big uh, uh, chunk. As you know, it was signed into law. President Trump did sign that. I don't know when everything is gonna be released yet, but what's interesting about, about these dollars that are coming from the feds, they go into special categories. There's a very large uh, amount of money that's going into public schools, some that goes into health care. And uh, once we get an idea of exactly how that's going to be put into the budget, then we can adjust accordingly with general fund. You know, our general fund was hit pretty hard. Uh, that's why we had to go into special session last, last summer, last June because uh, of the uh, decline in oil and gas revenue. But well, uh, we, we've done better with oil and gas, and it is certainly not anywhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be in June. Well, one of the things that concerned me is the new COVID bill that uh, Mr. Trump signed didn't really have any money for the state's general uh, fund. You know, they, they earmarked all of that money in that COVID bill um, the money that the state will probably get to control completely is the uh, uh, the money for the distribution of the vaccines. Uh, that money is in there, isn't it? Yeah, there's money in there for that. And the state also put money into distribution of vaccine uh, expenses because we'd like to get that out as quickly as possible. Good thing about things being earmarked, it means that we don't have to spend as much necessarily of general fund if there's going to be a big influx of, of federal dollars. An example is out of this last CARES package that was signed by President Trump is that uh, there'll be approximately $40 million that'll be of a discretionary nature for the PED secretary. And it's it can be used for things that you know they they prioritize in public education, but you know it's going to be a real interesting year regarding education as you've seen the two lawsuits that have come forward uh, that directly impact Gallup and McKinley County and the surrounding districts. And they directly impacts the state budget because it directly the, impacts the state budget. Uh, I mean, uh, recently we saw the ruling on the Zuni lawsuit. Uh, the uh, way capital outlay money is distributed to public schools and the disadvantage areas like ours have because we don't, we're not, we can't tax property. Right. Um, I don't know if the governor is going to appeal that or we just start working on it to correct it. But the other issue is impact aid. This year, I will have a bill myself and the speaker to just take credit take that whole issue of credits out of the budget process. You know, that's been a point of contention for years and years, and it's time that it comes out of there. I don't understand how it happened. Uh, I've got oh, some I ideas, think. but it, it's it's way beyond its time, and it's time that we change that. Yeah, I, if you ever want the history of the impact aid bill, I can give you the whole thing, but it's too long to talk about today. But um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's an interesting uh, story because somebody's toes got stepped on. And uh, so I'll, I'll give you the whole spiel at some point. But okay. uh, that money for years, the, uh, the majority of the impact aid money has gone into the state budget to fund other schools rather than Gallup and, and Zuni and Farmington. So this will be interesting. 
it's a big it's not a big chunk of money anymore i don't think patty i think it's pretty much it's lowered every year well we uh can't we uh, use 60 million dollars inside the funding formula that comes directly from credit of the impact aid of school districts okay so i think what'll happen and what we've calculated in the past about 20 million would come back to this school district if we take away that whole concept of credits so that's uh that's a good good chunk of money that I, this district could could use. I yes, and it's very needed. Um, they you mentioned oil and gas. I saw last night on the news that oil and gas is is beginning to creep up again. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the things that I was wondering about, and I have no knowledge about it at all, is we are uh, going more and more uh, wind power and solar power. And are those taxed any different ways than just the uh, being on the property? I mean, I don't understand. Um, will they be taxed like oil and gas has always been a, a really good revenue source? Uh, and now we're going to replace oil and gas with solar power and, and wind power. Are we doing anything with taxing them? We will be looking at this year this year on how that will be rolled out because I absolutely agree that that needs to happen with the um, reduction of use of uh, carbon, mm -hmm. carbon uh, based fuels and fossil right. fuels. Uh, we're gonna have to have a uh, revenue source. So I absolutely believe electric vehicles will be on that as well as solar and uh, wind. I think that's gonna be an interesting discussion. We'll probably look at best practices how other states have done this, that have been involved with alternative energies longer than we have. But uh, we're gonna have to have something because oil and gas is such a big player in this state. I mean, it drives our budget. And well, you know, uh, I think one no of the things about it. Best practices, Patty, are gonna be difficult to find because we've, we've relied on coal first and then oil and gas. And now we're moving into, you know, the, the better fuels. Um, not a lot of states have had been in our situation where they had a lot of fossil uh, fuels and they're also going into wind and solar. So um, I think that's what I'm talking about is best practices on how a taxing structure should be set up, because um, at face value, I don't know how you tax the wind. I mean, I wouldn't know how to do that, but it would be probably on what's generated. It would be amount of, uh, say, electricity as an example. So it would have to be based on something like that as opposed to the base fuel source. Right. That, well, that's what I'm saying. It's going to be a, a really, really different kind of, of uh, source of income than the oil and gas and coal were. You know, those were, were nice kinds of things that were easily taxed. They're so. easily taxed. And from my perspective, I'm going to miss them. I mean, I, you know, as uh, we've lost two major industries in this county, uh, we haven't felt the full impact yet, but I guarantee you in two years we will if we're not able to replace those personal in those personal incomes and and the property tax and everything else. I mean, when you lose uh, something like an Escalante power plant and right. Marathon, uh, that is a major, major economic hit to this area. Well, and the other thing that we never ever talk about is those oil pipelines that we have running through uh, McKinley County and the oil and gas that, you know, they, isn't there a big gas pipeline from through, uh, to, it was a cracking station out there? Yes, there's there's a number of uh, pipelines that go through our county. Uh, and those are big oil. property, yeah, those are property tax, real, real big property taxes. And we also have, um, natural gas lines uh, throughout the county, uh, big ones. So you're right about that. Uh, they're, they're spread throughout McKinley County. Yeah, and so, you know, I don't know how the, the changeover is gonna affect those because, you know, they're really, we're just a pass through here for a lot of those uh, pipelines, but those, those are big, big uh, revenue uh, sources, especially for schools. Yes. Uh, I think that's part of our argument about getting our impact aid uh, credit uh, taken away is because we need those dollars. I mean, that's truly what it, it was set up for is, is districts like Gallup-McKinley uh, 
when the feds decided we've got to find a way in lieu of, of property tax to help these schools. Right. Well, that, you know, I, I asked several times for the federal government to just pay its property taxes, and then we wouldn't have to go back and ask them for money. <laughs> yeah. <Huh? laughs> That's a good idea. I thought that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> That nobody nobody took me seriously, but I thought we should. Um, what are some of the other things that uh, that we're working on now for next year with the uh, with the state budget? You know, we with well, COVID. Thing, well, with COVID, we haven't done anything with economic development. We didn't put anything. Uh, we didn't have a committee to take care of the economy while we were trying to take care of the pandemic. Are we going to have a a group that will actually? try to mesh those two together so we can work this year? Yeah, what I'm hoping is that we actually take seriously our recovery plan and a, a recovery program. I think what's happened is that because nobody really had any answers and a lot of the decisions are medical driven through a medical team that the governor uses right. in terms of trying to you know, stop the spread, I think we're, we know now we've got a vaccination out now that hopefully everyone who wants it is able to get it. That now we can start moving forward because it's not just the state of New Mexico, it's the whole economy. It's the whole country's economy that's come to a standstill, which of course affects us. I mean, uh, we saw that with travel. We see what hap what's happened to our international airport in Albuquerque because people aren't traveling anymore. All these tourist destinations like Santa Fe and Taos and, and places like that. I, I can tell you a story when I was in uh, Santa Fe for one of our LFC meetings, I think it was a December meeting. No, it was a November meeting. I was there and in the hotel where I, was, I stay, I was the only guest for three days. Now wow. hotels can't afford to have just one guest uh, like that, so I, I've seen it. And you know, that would be a time where you'd have a lot of winter tourists, uh, whether they're out doing snowshoeing or they're doing their winter stuff. Uh, and that hotel attracts a lot of those kinds of tourists, the outdoorsy people. Yeah, uh, I was it. I was the only person in that place, which was a little eerie. <laughs> and it was me and three staff people each, each evening. So um, I can see what's happened. Uh, because of the na uh, nation's economy and how it's affected us. But certainly the biggest hit has been to extractive industries, to oil and gas. I mean, Marathon uh, Petroleum was making airplane or uh, jet fuel. And people aren't traveling, they're not buying jet fuel anymore. So look at the ripple effect even to our small, our small area in our county. I think the other thing is, is that people also just have this fear factor, you know, um, gee, do I go into the office? Do I stay home? How do I try to do this? And I, I question productivity that also ties into the economy. I know I can't work at home. It's been terrible. Uh, it's distracting. You don't have all your stuff there. You don't have, you know, you don't want to be using uh, your kitchen table to deal with projects. You know, you want to be in a place where you can go back into a file and you've got the support you need to get things done. And I, we're just a small office here. But I mean, for the bigger operations, uh, we saw we saw lots of growth with, uh, I think, uh, groups like Walmart, where you have uh, a lot of retail being sold. But what happened to the smaller businesses was was tragic. Well, you know, part of the thing uh, I think is the that the lack of planning for the economy, as you say, the the state and the feds both use all of the medical people to guide us through this pandemic. And right. that's wonderful. I mean, that's the health part of it. And I think we need to pay attention to that. But there's got to be a way and a system to work the economy and the pandemic together. No, I, I agree mean, with you. I absolutely do. And, and part of it is, is making sure that we've got adequate infrastructure to do that. And then, of course, in New Mexico is broadband. I mean, it's in this state is so far behind the power curve on that for a lot of reasons. Uh, it, it doesn't become a priority until things like this happen. Then all of a sudden, by God, we better get broadband built. We right. better figure out a way to get everybody connected, whether it's for health or education or the economy. Um, because we were hoping at least some of these uh, 
home-based businesses would still be able to function uh, pretty effectively. Some of them have, some of them haven't. Um, well, if we you look get, at the num, if you look at the numbers, Patty, uh, there's no way for for restaurants, for example, to uh, actually exist on a 25 percent uh, uh, population in their restaurant or the no. the hotels. Hotels have to have at least a 40 percent occupancy rate or they're broke. And, you know, we're not looking at those real numbers that people use every day of the week to run their businesses. And yeah, so we need to look true. at how we do that. And that's very true. And we've raised a lot of those same issues, the legislature and the legislative members have with the administration, particularly on restaurants. And you are a former restaurant owner, so you know it better than I would. Uh, but what, what my conversations has been is that a lot of them just won't even open at that 25% because some of them aren't set up for takeout to start with. And I talked to a good friend of mine that actually owns a Dairy Queen. And I asked him, I said, how does, how does this affect you guys? He said, not really. He said, because we're, we are the kind of business that is a takeout business. Right. He said, but you take a regular restaurant and expect them to try to duplicate what we're doing. He said, it's impossible. He says, they don't function that way. They're not set up for it. Well, and they, they don't have the, the parking area. They don't have the phone systems. They don't have any of these things to do that with. But a major, major problem with the, the restaurants in particular, Patty, is this business of one day they're saying, close the doors. And the next day they're saying, open the doors. You've got 25% or 50% or whatever. The food that you have to buy is there. You know, it takes a week to get the food there. And then if you close it down, you lose all that food. And people do not realize, you know, the inventory in a restaurant has to turn every month. But if you have an inventory just sitting there, it spoils. And, you know, we're not like the rug business where the rug can sit there for 100 years. Yeah, that's you hit the nail on the head of the most critical issue that I've heard from the business community. It's not consistent. Today yeah. we're closed, tomorrow we're open. Today we're closed, tomorrow we're open. And it didn't make sense to me either about having those short time frames. I could see it, okay, this month we're not going to be open. Right. But I don't like to hear, but today we're not open, tomorrow we are, and then the next day we aren't, you know, that right. kind of thing. That doesn't make any sense to me in the world, especially with a virus situation. Yeah. Really, what is 24 hours? I mean, it, it, it's, it's uh, crushing for a business uh, to have to do that. Well, as I say, these all of these little things I feel would have been uh, talked about earlier, Patty, in a situation where the health people and the business people were together. Well, and she did have the business council. And it's interesting to me that there weren't more recommendations like that coming out from the business council. But it's just like what we hear from education. It's that same kind of, are we up or are we down? Mm -hmm. uh, are we are we in school or are we virtual? Are we there two days a week or are we there no days a week? And well, well okay. that's another place, Patty, yeah. that I really get upset with is, you know, the PED should have been planning how to be virtual. They should have had some direction from the state for every district as to actually uh, the curriculum that you need to be virtual. What we've got happening is we have uh, regular teachers in our classrooms that are having to create their own virtual curriculum. And you can't just pick up the school curriculum and say, okay, this is the curriculum because being virtual is a whole lot different and it's different interactions and there's different ways to do things. So the PED should have created and we should have that in the bucket somewhere where we can use it um, and know how to do virtual teaching. We, we don't know how to do that yet. Yeah, and it's so interesting because I participated in a couple of conferences that were virtual and it got to the point where if we had a decent speaker and if it was for a shorter period of time, you could stay engaged. 
Right. But if it was something that would, would drone on and drone on in most conference settings, you can get up and go get a cup of coffee or get up and walk around in these settings like we're doing now. You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you either sit there and try to pay attention or you or you don't. But I agree with you. I think it's harder uh, for people. I, I've presented myself and it, I I help teach one class a year. It's an economic development class and it's a two hour uh, responsibility I have. And I did lots of charts. I did lots of question and answer. I just wanted people to stay engaged. And just for that one day, for that two hour period, it was very, very hard. No, but think about think about the little grade school kid that's supposed to be sitting there at a four to six hours. And, and with a mask on. <laughs> so, <laughs> with a ma- oh, yeah. Yeah. That's another, that's yeah another I, I've seen them. I uh, actually got to observe some of that when they were doing the one of the school districts had the kids there two days a week. And of course, the masks are on the ground. They're switching of masks. There's pulling them off of each other. You know, the same kind of stuff we would have done. Well, there, I mean, my, I go to the grocery store, my mask comes to my nose. So, you know, I, I'm always <laughs> in trouble. I have to keep pulling it up. Yeah, oh, um, yeah they, they, I get that. <laughs> what, um, for the goals for 2021, I'm so happy it's 2021. Me too. Uh, what are the goals? What are, what are we hoping with Corona if it's, if it's gone, if the vaccines all work, uh, say April, March? Uh, what do you hope for New Mexico, Patty? Well, what I'm hoping is that uh, we're able to rebuild our economy first. I think that we need to rebuild our education system. I mean, uh, I think it's been devastated. The loss of learning uh, from last March, you know, when everything was shut down. Yep. And I, I felt real bad about those kids that were about ready to graduate from high school. And all of a sudden, boy, it's all zip and you're now you're done kind of yep. thing. I think we need to I think we need to get that loss of learning back up best way we can. I would like to see uh, some replacement uh, industry for that of what we'd lost in this area. You know, after all, I do represent this area and it's my it's my priority. I've right. got a statesmanship responsibility as a as a committee chair, but at the end of the day, I want things that are going to work for my community first. I uh, also am hoping now that we've got a new administration in Washington that some of this uh, battling can be squashed. You know that people are tired of that. Yeah. Uh, people are tired of that fighting all the time, and certainly I am too. I want to see chaos. That. It it's been chaos. It's been tough. And and you see that even in Santa Fe. And, I, and I'm one of those people that I, I think that's nonsense. And we just need to start working together, you know, and, and make, make these things well, work. We, we need to have plans that are going to actually improve our, all of our lives, uh, yes. not just what's easy to do, I think, Patty. Um, one of the things that I think that the legislature ought to consider is um, we these kids, many of our kids have lost a whole year of learning. And so, you know, putting uh, 13 years or 14 years of public school, I don't think is too bad. Mm-hmm. We ought to consider that. Yeah, now I understand also that there's been a uh, movement to say that we don't need to test. Right. Uh, and I guess I don't completely understand that. I don't know how you gauge if somebody's learned anything. And I'm not a professional educator, but it would seem to me that you'd have to have some indication. And the reasoning is, is they said, well, we had to shut everything down in March. Well, that I get that. A good reason to test. Yeah. I mean, I think you kind of you need to know where people are. Yeah. And Um, then we need to know what they need. Exactly. Because higher ed is throwing its hands up also right now saying everything's virtual. They're not, they've got a major drop in enrollment because kids don't want to go to college from their kitchen table. Yep. You know, they want a real college experience. And I, I can't even imagine that when I was in college, sitting at my mother and father's kitchen table on a computer and paying the same amount as though I were there. Yeah, well, that's the big problem. Anyway, yeah. I think we've run out of time. Uh, always we run out of time, Patty. <laughs> Uh, but good luck. Uh, you do a wonderful job, and we're all very, very proud of you. 
Uh, I've had actually, I tell people that I was going to do this with you today and people are going, when is it going to be on channel 21? <laughs> well, right now we don't know when it'll be on channel 21, but I will let you know. I'll call Melody and tell her when it's going to okay. be on, but it's going to be on Facebook. It's going to be on the Seven Cities uh, production uh, website, which is sevencities.com. It will run, it's streaming. You can find it. It'll be on YouTube and on Instagram. Okay. So it'll well, be on get, all of those things. Pick up everybody that's 25 years and younger, because they all follow that stuff. They're all into social media stuff. Yes. Well, so this is who you're going to hit this this year. And uh, that's a really exciting, exciting thing for us. And I've enjoyed this. I mean, you know, we're at the kitchen table here. And right. uh, well, I'm in my office. <laughs> but, you have an office. I don't have an office. So okay. that's what we're doing. Anyway, thank you so much and good luck in Santa Fe. And we're very proud of the work that you do. Well, thank you, Barbara. And I appreciate this. You know, like you say, we've been doing this every year since I've been elected. And that's been a long time. Well, so. this is the most important show I do every year. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, thanks, Barbara. Happy uh -huh. New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.